please turn, turn to Psalm chapter 32. And we're going to dig into this chapter. You can follow along the screen if you don't have your Bible with you or your, your smartphone or anything like that. But this is a psalm written by David. And in this psalm, he's doing some proclaiming. He's doing some reflecting. He's doing some instructing. And he ends up doing some rejoicing. How about that? Sometimes it looks a lot like us. We run through these, these emotions throughout our days and throughout our weeks. And that's one of the reasons why I love the Psalms is because you can see the good, the bad, and the ugly all laced in, in this response to God coming from the heart of David. And so let's start in verse 1, Psalm chapter 32. He says this, How blessed is the one whose rebellious acts are forgiven, whose sin is pardoned. How blessed is the one whose wrongdoing the Lord does not punish, in whose spirit there is no deceit. David's proclaiming, he's proclaiming blessing over the forgiven. Have you been forgiven? Amen. Hey, can you testify to the fact that you're free? Yes. The forgiven live a blessed life. The blessed life is the life that's heading in the right direction, a holy direction, a God-centered direction. Verse three, when I refused to confess my sin, my whole body wasted away. While I groaned in pain all day long, for day and night you tormented me. You tried to destroy me in the intense heat of summer. Then I confessed my sin, I no longer covered it up. I no longer covered up my wrongdoing and I said, I will confess my rebellious acts to the Lord. And then you forgave my sins. Have you ever felt God pursuing you with his conviction? Like he's just hot on your heels. David's reflecting on his, his own experience, the turmoil caused by his own direction. He says he felt like his whole body was wasting away, but confession changed his direction on his rebellious road. We have a story like that, don't we? This family room is dotted with stories of God turning lives around. Let's read on verse six. For this very reason, every one of your faithful followers should pray to you while there's a window of opportunity. Certainly, when the surging water rises, it will not reach them. You are my hiding place. You protect me from distress. Aren't you thankful for a shelter? Aren't you thankful for a hiding place? A God that is our rock and our redeemer. He says this, continuing in verse seven, you surround me with shouts of joy from those celebrating deliverance. And listen to the, the community that's laced into this verse. You surround me with shouts of those who celebrate deliverance. Sometimes you just gotta be in church, amen? Sometimes you just gotta be in church even when you don't want to go, even when you're in a rough spot, it's worth it to be surrounded by the shouts of those that are experiencing deliverance, the ones that have been set free, the ones that have been turned around, the ones that have been recovered, the ones that have been redeemed and restored. Why? Because it's a faith builder. And on those days when you don't feel like getting up and you don't feel like going to the house of God, do it anyway, why? because it's gonna feed your soul. Amen. Hearing the testimonies of others. And if you're here this morning and you're in that tough spot, know that as we've sung, as we've prayed, you are surrounded by stories of grace, Amen. stories of deliverance. It goes on to say this in verse eight, I'll instruct you and teach you about how you should live. I'll advise you as you, and I will look you in the eye. Do not be like an unintelligent horse or mule, which will not obey you unless they're controlled by a bridle and a bit. He's instructing here, how should you live? Not like a horse that needs to be broken, bitten mouth and controlled, but as people who humbly acknowledge the fact that we're broken from the start, that we need a savior, that we're in need of his grace and mercy. Verse 10, an evil person suffers much pain, but the Lord's faithfulness overwhelms the one who trusts in him. Rejoice in the Lord and be happy. You who are godly, shout for joy all you who are morally upright. He closes with this rejoicing. It's better to be overwhelmed by his faithfulness than to be overwhelmed by our faults. Amen? He invites us to experience his faithfulness and because of that, we can shout for joy. Thank God for the word. Thank God for the reminders in the word. And as we continue on this U-turn series, it's important to understand that, that none of us, 
None of us are immune to responding to our feelings over our actions and choices and the guilt that we sometimes feel. And the Christian response ought to be rooted in faith and repentance. Faith is trust in the promise of grace in Jesus Christ as an all-sufficient Savior. And repentance is the other side of that coin of faith, this change of mind, this turning from sin towards Christ. That's the U-turn. In other words, it's us saying, God, I have been completely wrong, and the gospel of Jesus Christ is completely right, and it's my only hope. That's how we pump the brakes, so to speak, in this journey of faith, and we take a new direction. And when it's part of our daily discipline, the Christian lifestyle, the Christian lifestyle blessed with this holy opportunity to repent. See, repentance is it's not a dirty word, it's a holy word. When that's part of our Christian lifestyle, it's a path to joy, like we saw in Psalm 32. My question for you today is what might be keeping you from making any necessary U-turns in your life? No doubt, while you've been driving, you've probably heard that still small voice in your GPS. Actually, it's not a still small voice in your GPS. It's actually rather annoying. At times, it makes me want to throw my phone out the window. But you've probably heard that voice as you've maybe veered from the route that the, the GPS is wanting you to go on, and all of a sudden, you hear recalculating, recalculating. Wouldn't it be great if, uh, if while you were on, on your route, if you really got off, the, the voice started saying different things instead of just recalculating? Recalculating, it turned into, seriously? <laughs> and then it went to, are you done yet? You know, it just kind of kept jabbing at you a little more and more and more until it really got to the point where you're going to turn around. But we've all heard recalculating. Well, there's moments in life where the Spirit is nudging us as well. And we, we need to pay attention to that voice. Amen. Telling us to turn around, get back on the right road. So what's keeping you heading in the wrong direction? What has you on, on that road? What's keeping you there? Is it, is it fear or is it pain? Is it anger? Is it past mistakes? Is it something like that at the wheel? Let's take a look at four things that can keep us from making a U-turn in life. First one I, I want to bring out is the fact that we tend to point fingers we blame shift. We point fingers at others. And I'm not talking about the finger that some of you might point at other cars while you're driving. Not that finger. We tend to point fingers, circumstances. That's my reason why I can't get over it. They are the reason I'm like this. This is why. He is why. She is why. We tend to point fingers. This is why I can't change. This is why I'm on the path that I'm on. This is why I'm on this road. It's because of this. This is a tough one because it shows up so early in the story of humanity. There was some blame shifting going on in the garden, wasn't there? A lot of times our first instinctual reaction is, it's not my fault. The devil made me do it. We've got some sort of excuse, some sort of way to divert the attention from us. But can I tell you this this morning? The best thing we can all do is just own it. Just own it. My wife's a passionate person. She's got strong opinions. And when, when she believes something, even when she's wrong, all right, uh, she'll state it in a way that's so fierce and so passionate, it makes me question even though I know what I know is right. And this always happens when we're driving. So we'll be driving, and this happened early on in our marriage, and God had to help us through this one. Uh, but we're driving, and I know where I'm going. I know what exit I'm supposed to take. I know where we're headed, but she said, no, no, it's, it's this way. No, it's, it's this way. No, the exit's coming up. You need to take this exit. And so passionate, so intense, and, and in the moment, she's like, take the exit. And I jerk the wheel, and there we go. We get off the exit. That was the wrong exit. And then it turns into, look what you made us do. Now we're going to be late. It's your fault. But when it comes down to it, I was the one behind the wheel. I was the one that was responsible. I'm the one driving. When it comes down to it, you're behind the wheel and you're responsible. 
You're responsible. I'm responsible. It's time to make a U-turn if necessary, and we can't play the finger-pointing game. You need to fight that habit. We all need to own it ourselves. But it's tough because the pain runs deep, right? The pain tends to run deep. Things happen that we didn't plan for, we didn't ask for, the things we didn't expect. And if I can be honest, I'm a recovering blame shifter myself. I'm a recovering finger pointer. And if I can be honest, I spent a lot of time driving down a road that bitterness took me down. Driving down a road that hurt took me down. And the temptation is to point fingers at my childhood, point fingers at family situation and say, this is why. That's why I am the way that I am. That's why I carry this around. That's where the hurt comes from. It's it's tempting to go there. And I used to live there, but the older I've gotten, I've realized I'm behind the wheel. And the hurt has been driving me out into a desert road of isolation It's time to take a U-turn, get back on the right road, Jared, because you can't take your emotions there. You can't take your marriage there. You can't take your kids there. You can't take your future there. It's time to turn around. You know what I've learned? I've learned there comes a point where you're either going to stay crippled or you're going to take up your mat and walk. And I'm not talking physically because honestly, I actually know a lot of people with physical hardships that are healthier people than others that seemingly have it all together. I'm talking about holistic personhood, who you are, spirit, soul, mind, body, because here's the truth. The healer has come. And when he says, do you want to be healed? Are you going to roll out your list of reasons why you can't get up out of what you're in? Are you going to take up your mat and walk? You have the choice because freedom is here. But so many times we want to roll out our mat and lay back down on that and say, I can't because this, because of that. Can I tell you this? You can't change the past, but you can change the way that you respond today, the way that you respond to life and the way that you walk into the future. Yes, there's hurt and there's scars and there's questions. I'm not diminishing any of that, but you can't lay on the mat for forever. There's an opportunity, an invitation for you to get up, mat in hand, and be whole in Jesus' name. And that becomes your testimony. Yeah, I once was bound. Yeah, I once had some hurt. Yeah, I once had these issues, but not anymore because of Jesus. My anger once had the wheel, my bitterness once had the wheel, my hurt once had the wheel, but Jesus helped me make a U-turn. I'm heading into a different future now because of him. Don't point fingers, don't blame shift, just own it. This is where I'm at. And realize that today is a good day to turn around, amen? So we tend to point fingers. Number two, we compare ourselves to others. This is one of those things that will keep us from making a proper U-turn. Something that can keep us from making a necessary U-turn in life is playing the comparison game. We tend to live like this. I I know I have some stuff I need to work on, but I'm doing pretty good compared to him. At least I'm not like that. At least I'm not like her. Goodness, at least we're not like them. Can I tell you, there's a fleshly comfort that we can settle into and we can look down our noses at other people and compare our mess to their mess and make a judgment call on whose mess is messier? We live like that. But can I tell you this also, if we're comparing ourselves to anyone other than Jesus Christ, our standards are too low. He is the standard, the perfect way to be human, the sinless lamb of God. We're called to conform to the image of Christ, not compare ourselves to others and fall into this complacent status quo way of handling our spiritual lives. And what's the point of keeping up with traffic if you're all heading in the wrong direction? Looking around saying, I guess I'm doing as good as everybody else, but if Christ is in the rearview mirror, you need to turn around. And orient your future focused on him. So we tend to shift blame, point fingers, play the comparison game. Number three, we medicate ourselves. 
we avoid the need to make a U-turn by numbing ourselves to our actions and our direction by medicating with something. And I'm not just talking about substance abuse. And if you're in the throes of addiction this morning, can I tell you there's hope? And you don't need to be ashamed. You just need to get it dealt with. You need to get some help. There are people sitting in this room that have been in that place and they're overcomers today. There's hope for you. I'm not just talking about that, go, that though, because when we talk about medicating, our, our mind automatically goes to, uh, to places like that. But I'm talking about other ways, too, that we medicate, numb ourselves. What about the ways that we medicate with achievement and power and success? We've put a destination into the GPS of our mind, and we're going to get there at any cost. Or the way that we medicate with cynicism and we tear others down in an attempt to make ourselves feel better about ourselves and our choices and our actions. It's like when the GPS is continually saying, recalculating, we're just ignoring, we're not going to adjust our route. That's when we start living like the proverb when it says that there's a way that seems right to a man, but in the end it leads to death. There's U-turns that need to happen. But we drown out the voice telling us to pump the brakes by medicating with busyness and commitments and addictions and all sorts of stuff. Listen, you can push it off, you can drown it out, you can hide it away under layers of what you try to cover it with, but you won't be able to drown out the voice in your soul that's continually calling you to recalculate. There's a God that desires relationship with you and his love is calling you home and won't leave you alone. You can't get away from it. You can't run from it. No matter how you medicate, it's calling, it's pursuing, it's wanting you to make your way to him. So we point fingers, we compare, we medicate. We also punish ourselves. And our punishment of ourself can keep us from making a proper U-turn. Sometimes we need to make a U-turn, but we've let guilt and condemnation take the wheel. We're caught in this mode of punishing ourselves, holding things over our own heads, counting ourselves out when it comes to what God has for our lives. We figure it's not going to get any better and I've got to pay for this. We attempt to atone for it ourselves. Can I tell you this? The price has been paid. The price has been paid. Jesus took the punishment. He paid the price so that we can be free. So don't hold your past over your head when his banner over you is love. Don't count yourself out when he's already counting you as one of his own. Jesus paid the price so that you don't have to pay. His grace is enough. His mercy is new every morning. We sang about it already. So go ahead and believe it. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away. For He's making things new. Do you believe that? Is your faith hinged on that? As far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our transgressions from us. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins were like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. We have no problem believing that Jesus is our Savior and that he got up out of a grave and, and resurrected, ascended. How, why is it so hard for us sometimes to forgive ourselves and to fully live in a free state knowing that God's really got this covered? We punish ourselves. The cool thing about a GPS is no matter where we're at on the road, when we're headed in the wrong direction, it's constantly recalculating. What's great is when you change direction, it's committed to getting you where you need to go. And guess what? God, God works like that. He only, he's different, though. He's, he's God. He doesn't need updates. The battery's not going to run out. He doesn't need a service that's going to run out. He doesn't need anything like that. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And this God is constantly calling your heart toward him, committed to get get you where he wants you to be, 
And we know that in scripture because you said that he who began a work in you will be faithful to complete it. So maybe you need to make a U-turn today and you need to take a look at what are the things that are keeping me from making that turnaround? What's keeping you from changing direction? Well, we talked about those four things. I also want to offer you three things that can help us recalculate and stay on the right road that God has for us. First and foremost, we can acknowledge sin daily. See, it's not enough to just go to God with broad generalizations about our sin. That's pretty easy. We can kind of float by with that. God, would you just forgive me of all my sin? God, would you help me to do better? But, but can I ask you, how about, how about getting specific? How about biblically naming it? How about personally owning it? Repentance should be this part of a daily lifestyle of, of a Christian. We get up, we die daily, we take up our cross and follow, GPS set, being led by the Spirit. And when we find ourselves veering from the path as we often do, heading in a wrong direction, recalculating, make the U-turn. See, centering our life on the cross and resurrection of Christ daily could save us from a whole season of pain. And some of us know that due to past experience. We wish we could get a season of our life back. But seriously, think about it. If we daily focus, we stay in step with the Spirit, can save us from an entire season of pain. The ancient Eastern church had a saying they would repeat with the heartbeat all throughout the day. It went something like this, Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And they said that as it became part of the rhythm of their lives, this constant reminder of the road that they should be on. You see, we're creatures of habit. We tend to get in ruts. And can I tell you this? The best kind of lifestyle to live is a lifestyle that allows God to mess up your regular lifestyle. Amen. All throughout the day when temptation hits, when your attitude flares up, when things aren't going your way, Instead of yanking the wheel off course, Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Helps you reorient, stay on the right road. So acknowledge sin daily. Two, run to God for safety. How can we recalculate? Run to God for safety. The safest place to be with our mistakes is to turn to the arms of a loving father. Don't go down the road of works to try to clear your name. Don't go down any road as far and fast as you can just running from something. Don't go down the road of a new relationship to make yourself feel better or a bigger bank account or more accomplishments to stack up. Just turn around. Run to the arms of a loving God. My first car was a 1973 Chevy Impala, roughly the size of this stage. It was big, it was ugly, but we paid cash for it. And I was 16, I didn't care. Well, I thought I didn't care. Until I got out on the road and the thing was really hard to drive and my friends all had newer cars and all that kind of stuff. But it was a big car and I drove that thing. And I think that God gifted me with my first year of driving as one big set of sermon illustrations. Because I can preach from my first year of driving and how terrible it was. I mean, it, it was awful. I mean, I, I, could, I could talk a lot. I, I could preach on alignment issues, okay? This car was so severely out of alignment that if I took my hands off the wheel, it was going to take a left-hand turn. I could preach on that about the way that I, I had to constantly cope and, and, and just really kind of uh, compensate for the way that my car wanted to turn into oncoming traffic, all right? Sometimes our lives are out of alignment, right? And instead of taking it to Jesus and really getting it figured out and getting back into alignment, we just learn to manage it. And we live scared and we live fearful and we learn to manage it and cope, keeping our, our hands on the wheel, taking control, because if we know if we let go, it's not going to be good. I can preach on some alignment issues. I can preach on, uh, on, on some worth issues. My car was ugly. Like ugly, ugly. 
Like ugly, 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 ugly. You know, it wasn't one of those old classics that was great looking. This was just ugly. In fact, I, I named my car El Conquistador. For those of you that don't habla espanol, that means the conqueror. Because it was huge, it was made of steel, and uh, people knew that I was coming because my car didn't look like everybody else's. And in, in fact, uh, it, it didn't look like much, and it really stood out in this really affluent high school in the area uh, that I went to. It's like Civic, Beamer, Acura, Honda, Toyota, Land Rover, and then Jared. <laughs> and I spent time being ashamed about what I drove because I felt like it didn't really measure up. I spent time parking my car in a far part of the parking lot because I felt kind of awkward walking in when everybody's pulling up and they're nice, shiny new cars. Isn't that silly that we get worth issues over stuff like that? But I can preach from it. I had some worth issues until I figured out my car had a V8 and it went a whole lot faster than the four-cylinder weed eaters that they were driving. I want to tell you, I can preach from that. You might feel like you don't look like much. You might feel like you don't measure up, but you don't know what's in you. You don't know what's in you. The frame may have taken some dings, and, and you're feeling like you've been weathered by life, but you don't know what's in you until the Spirit of God rises up and does the work within you and through you, and before you know it, there's a power at work in your life like you never knew. I can preach from some stuff about my first year of driving, but the one I want to bring out today is the dangerous habit that I developed of running on empty. I was 16. I didn't have hardly any money. And the money I did have, I didn't want to spend it on gas. I'd rather take a girl out, you know? So I'm like, I'm fishing for quarters in every couch I can find and, and all this kind of stuff. And so I learned a little trick. An unhealthy trick. Yakima, Washington, where I was learning to drive, has some pretty hilly areas. And so I learned a trick. If I revved up the hill, got going, I got to the top of the hill, I could pop my car into neutral, and I could coast for one or two hills. And then rev the gas. I, stupid, I know it. These guys are already chuckling at me. And so I... I would do that, and I would, I would just pull into the gas station, just barely making it, fill up very minimally, and I'd keep coasting. I knew the hills that I would go down that would help me out, get to the top of it, pop it into neutral, and I would coast as long as I could. Little did I know, and I could preach from a whole different, different set of circumstances here, that all the stuff at the bottom of the gas tank was being pulled up into the engine. I could talk about running on empty and how it affects your system. Amen? Amen. If you're not getting filled up spiritually, all the junk in your soul, in your life is going to get, it's going to come out. But I'd learned this, this routine of, of driving, and, and I was a little scared to do it at first, but like anything, when we get used to it, it becomes commonplace, and then we get careless. So I remember very vividly one day, I'm, I'm doing my thing. I'm riding my hills and I'm coasting, trying to save gas, do anything that I can. I get to the top of the hill, not thinking, something I'd always done, routine. I go to pop it in a neutral and I go too far. You ever heard the sound of a car that's thrown into reverse at 55 miles an hour? That's a scary sound. And it scared the life out of me. And the car shut down and made this awful noise, and it quit. It just said, I'm done. And it just kind of rolled off the side of the road. And in that moment, I'm sitting there, and I'm, I'm thinking, I've screwed up. I have ruined my car. And then all the consequences and the repercussions of that come flooding in. Think about it. We get in dangerous patterns in our lives. We start doing things and at first we're just compensating and we're just trying to figure this out but before we know we get comfortable with it and then we get careless. We go too far. 
and we're in a mess. Dangerous. Dangerous ways of operating. Instead of doing it the right way, we know sometimes about reaping what we've sown, right? Thankfully, sitting there in my, my car and it's steaming and everything like that, I, I, I prayed. Oh, God, please. <laughs> it didn't start the first time. It revved the second time, thankfully, and I, and I drove it for a couple more months. However, I never put oil in my car, and one morning the engine seized up. So, Dad, I'm sure you're probably never going to watch this on YouTube, but that's what happened. Sorry. <laughs> I, learned a, I learned a lot my first year of driving. We can talk about some stuff, but the point is, there's a dangerous habit I developed. When you don't run to God for safety, you're running the risk of developing dangerous habits of running elsewhere, down roads that are going nowhere good. Turn around. Turn around. Take a lesson from the prodigal. He left home on this road bent on wasteful and, and reckless abandon. He squandered everything and found himself in the most humiliating situation that he'd ever been in. He was broke, he was starving, he was friendless, and he was, on, he was wanting to eat pig slop. It's pretty bad. He squandered everything. In Luke 15, 17, though, there's a U-turn moment. He said, when he came to his senses. When he came to his senses, the road he was on, he remembered a place where he was loved, where he was provided for, where he was safe, where he was loved as a son, and you know what he did? He turned around. And what's awesome is his dad went straight up, Tom Bodet from Motel 6 on him. He left the light on. He was waiting on him. He's waiting on him to come home, and guess what? God left the light on for us too. He's left the light on for you. He's left the light on for me. It's Jesus Christ, the light of the world, the way, the truth, and the life. There's always a way to go back home. And I can see it in my mind, this son going home. He's been in a distant land, and I imagine when his feet hit a familiar road, he thought in his mind, I'm almost home. Like when you've been away for a long time, you've been on a long drive, and you pull onto your street, you get that feeling. I'm almost home. Make the U-turn into the arms of the loving Father. Your place of safety. Thirdly and finally, as we're closing, one thing that can help us recalculate is when we get really honest about our sin and honest about the gospel, Honest about our sin and honest about the gospel. See, the truth is, is that our sin is worse than we know. The depravity runs deeper than we know. But also, the gospel is more sufficient than we could ever even understand. If we're going to be honest about our sin, we've also got to be honest about the gospel. We've got to get gut level honest about the sin in our lives. And when we do that, it can get us down. But if we're going to get gut level honest about the way that we missed the mark, we've also got to be fully honest about the truth of the gospel, that there was an ultimate U-turn that has ever been made. It was by the Savior, Jesus Christ, crucified on the cross, buried, put in the grave, three days later, raised to life, ascended to heaven, coming again. Death was in the driver's seat, but Jesus kicked him out, took the wheel, turned everything around. And if we're going to be honest, Honest, we've got to be completely honest. Yes, our sin is great, but his love is greater. Yes, we were once lost, but now we're found. Yes, we were once enemies of God, but now we are friends of God. Yes, we're broken, but the healer makes us whole. Yes, we were lacking, but he's the provider. Yes, we were bound, but he breaks every chain. If you're going to get honest, you got to get completely honest. That yes, there's sin, but there's a savior. The U-turn is possible. Yeah. Honest about our sin, but honest about the gospel. Yes. What Jesus Christ has done. No matter what road you're on today, a U-turn is available. Today is the day of salvation. 
No matter how far you feel you've gone, physically, emotionally, spiritually, it doesn't matter. Make that turn. You'll find a loving father. Arms wide open, waiting on you. And the truth is, he's been pursuing you all along. So maybe you've been in the mode of pointing fingers, comparing yourself to others and feeling like it's just not going to happen for you. Maybe you've been in the throes of medicating and trying to push it off and ignore it. I don't know, it may be a mix of all of it. But I do know you can make a U-turn today. Let's stand.